Why don't you guys flip to Philippians 2 with me? It is the book directly after Ephesians. And we're going to get there here in a moment. Thank you, Lord. Man, that was amazing. It was. That was amazing. I love when the Lord just, he just sees faithful. He comes. He comes. He likes to be with his people. And that is my favorite thing about him is he, he, not only does he like being with his people, he actually wants to be with us more than we even want to be with him. So that's pretty spectacular. Um, I want to talk to you guys about one of my favorite people in Christian history this morning, uh, St. Polycarp. St. Polycarp, he was born in 60 AD, and he was actually the direct uh, disciple of the Apostle John. Yes, the same Apostle John who was the beloved, uh, the same Apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation. Um, And Polycarp served the church of Smyrna. If you're familiar with Smyrna, that's actually, Rodney actually hit on it last week while he was reading in the book of Revelation. Polycarp served the church of Smyrna for many decades. Uh, The same church of Smyrna was read about in Revelation chapter 2, where the Apostle John writes that Jesus is the first and the last who died, but came back to life. He writes to this church about their riches in the midst of tribulation. And this is one of two churches out of the seven churches he writes to that Jesus actually has no critical feedback for, which is pretty darn awesome. Because most of them, he says, I love that you did this. I love that you do this. But here's what I have against you. With the church of Smyrna, they're experiencing great tribulation. and Jesus has nothing to say about what they're doing wrong. Only the encouragement of what's coming. Yay. <laughs> the Lord's speaking. He's reading. He's ready. <laughs> um, and so in... It's Okay. <laughs> Hey, if there's anything being read on your phone, that's it. It's the word. Come on. Tell you what, that's awesome. So he writes to this, uh, this church, uh, the Apostle John, who is actually, he's writing to his disciple, uh, Polycarp. And the promise for that specific church is that if they are faithful, even until death, they will receive a crown of life. And at this same church, a mob of Romans came knocking at Polycarp's door, This mob had already put several Christians to death, and they were actually beginning to call for the death of Polycarp, who was a well-known Christian leader in that area. He was able to escape to the nearby country and spent most of his time in solitude praying. It's uh, It's written here specifically that he specifically said, there he remained with his few companions, devoting himself to night and day to constant prayer to the Lord, pleading and imploring as he had always done that God would grant peace to the churches throughout the world. So his number one prayer was, Lord, but let there be peace to every church throughout the world. Officials eventually hunted Polycarp down, transported him to the city of Rome, and ushered him into the arena where a huge crowd began to call for his death. As the accounts read, an audible voice from heaven is actually heard from the people around, from God speaking to Polycarp, and they said that they, everyone could hear, be strong, Polycarp, play the man. Um, The Roman governor pressured him to deny Christ and to swear to Caesar, but Polycarp refused. His response was this, for 86 years I have been Christ's servant, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Swear by Caesar's fortune, the governor shouted. Polycarp replied, if you imagine that I will swear by Caesar's fortune as you put it, pretending to not to know who I am, I will tell you plainly. I am a Christian. The governor increased his threats. He said, I have wild beasts. I will throw you to them if you don't change your attitude. Polycarp said, call them. Call them. Hardcore. If you make light of the beasts, I will have you destroyed, the governor said. Polycarp says, the fire you threaten burns for a time and is soon extinguished. There is a fire you know nothing about. The fire of judgment to come and eternal punishment, the fire reserved for the ungodly. But why do you hesitate? Do what you want. 
The governor said, this fellow is the father of Christians, the destroyer of our gods, who teaches numbers of people not to sacrifice or even worship. Enraged, the crowd calls for his death. They bound Polycarp to a stake, stacked wood around him, and set him on fire. Meanwhile, Polycarp prayed, I bless thee for counting me worthy of this day and hour, that in the, in the number of the martyrs I may partake of Christ's cup to the resurrection of both soul and body. As he's being burned alive, he says, I bless you. Thank you for counting me worthy to be part of these martyrs. What is going on in this man that when you come to this man and you say, we have lions we're ready to feed you to. They're hungry. And he goes, call them. <laughs> what in the world? Oh, you know what? If that doesn't sound good, how about we give you the slowest death possible and we burn you alive? I know a fire you don't even know about. What is that that causes a man to be so possessed by Christ that he values his life even, even unto death? He just doesn't count it worth anything. But he says, oh my gosh, what a privilege to be, count myself as one of these martyrs. And as Rodney talked about last week, what did he receive in that? The promise was Polycarp receives a crown. But I tell you, later in the Revelation, it says that, that the saints would be throwing their crowns at Jesus' feet. So you imagine Polycarp comes into eternity, has a crown on his head, and the first thing he does is, this ain't mine. But Polycarp, you, you were burned alive. It's, it's just nothing. It's not anything compared to the worth and the value of Jesus. What is that? What is it? It's, it's a man who loves God, not for his own benefit. A man who has learned to love God for God's sake and not love God for his own sake. He did not pray, Lord, bring me peace while he was in the countryside while they were trying to hunt him down. Lord, please help protect me. Bring, my, bring me peace. Help me. Help me. No, he said, Lord, bring peace to every church. What kind of selfless man are we talking about today? In the face of being burned alive, and actually, as the account goes, he didn't even die from being burnt alive. He is burned until he does not die, and then they killed him with a sword. So when we start talking about, oh, we're being, you know, we're, having, we're going through a rough day, <laughs> we got to remind ourselves, we are so blessed, and guess who's really, really good? He's really good. And so when we start going, I don't understand. Why are we laughing? Why are we saying he's good, he's good, he's good over and over again? We remind ourselves he's good because guess what we're not being, guess what's not happening to us? We are not being burnt at the stake. We are not being fed to lions as the Romans were. How good is that? So in, the, in this, it's really probably my first series ever. Um, I don't usually do series, but uh, I've, I've walked you guys through this whole process of the four degrees of love, which is from St. Bernard. He's a French monk. Um, he actually was a French monk, much like many of you might know, Brother Lawrence, who is a, if you've read The Practicing of the Presence of God, he was a French monk as well. St. Bernard was a monk in Clairvaux, France. And uh, he came up with this idea of, there's four degrees of love, love for self for self's sake, love of God for self's sake, which is what we've talked about. And now we're talking about love of God for God's sake. And in love of self's sake, we talked about the self-absorption in the implosion of one's soul when our whole world revolves around me, me, me. This whole idea of a world we live in where my truth and my happiness is our priority, but in the end, it actually creates this implosion of one's soul where we get so captivated on ourselves, we implode on ourselves. Um, and, then la and then the last time I spoke, I talked to you guys about love of God for self's sake, which is really loving God for our benefit, not for his. Um, that's kind of where I think many of us start. It's not, it's not the rule. That doesn't mean many of us start there. But many of us start loving God because he's amazing and he has so many gifts, right? He, he loves us. He gives us freedom from our sin. He, he, uh, uh, he forgives us. He welcomes us and adopts us into his family. He blesses us with so many gifts and things in our lives. And so it's easy to start being like, man, God, you're awesome. 
I, I'm just ready to make a list and just start sending it to you and hopefully you don't check it twice, right? <laughs> so it's like we, we, sometimes we start doing that where we start coming to God and we're like, I just can't wait to be around you for what I can get from you. But there's a deeper level of love that we can have for the Lord. And it is when we start to love him for him and his goodness. We love him for his presence and not for what his hands can do for us. So that's where we are today. I've been looking forward to, that, to, to this because I believe this is the deepest, richest, most potent, lava, hot, awesome section of just Christianity is when we step into relationship with him where we start to realize he's the reward. Like he's the treasure. The treasure isn't uh, being noticed. The treasure isn't getting a microphone. The treasure isn't having an, an amazing worship set, which all of that comes, right? Like today, it was just like, ah, this is amazing. And it's just from a few hearts who came just ready this morning. Like uh, the whole worship team, you can tell when the worship team shows up ready to love God. You can tell. There's days where the worship team's tired. And I could be one of them, okay? I'm not throwing, I'm not throwing stuff. But when the whole worship team shows up like today, and we are all just like, he's so good. And we've known it from Monday. We've known it till now. We are ready. You can feel it. Can't you? Where it's like, I'm not interested in how I'm feeling today. I'm ready to love him. Regardless of what's going on in here, I'm ready to give him a gift. And that's what we saw this morning, right? And so this morning, it's, it's about us learning what does it mean to love God for his benefit and not ours? We love God not for what he can do for us, but because he is altogether good and supremely lovable. He is supremely lovable. We learn to love him for who he is with no strings attached because guess who loved you with no strings attached? I love this topic. I just, I just feel like I'm marinating up here and you guys are watching. <laughs> I'm like in the, the what uh, George and Banoff calls the joy jacuzzi. I just feel like I'm in my own little hot tub of love right now with the Lord. We learn to love God for who he is because he is just good. And our loves are directly tied to what we want most. What you love in this world, I've talked to you guys about, I love Oreos so much that if I, if I loved Oreos anymore, I'd just become an Oreo. Like, I love Oreos. It's because my wants are tied to what I love. And, and really, whatever you want the most in your life, it's going to take you to those things you love. Um, there, are, there are these cravings and motivations that we follow. And if we allow God to change what we will, he can change what we love. And when he can change what we love, we step into the fullest extent of human delight that one can experience. That when we allow him to mold and shape the wills and the cravings that are going on inside of us, we actually learn to approach him and go, oh, there's a different way to live. I can approach you without a list of things I need from you and realize you're actually what I need, God. That yes, I have all these things, but you are my rock. You are my salvation. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. I could keep going. You are the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You're the prince of peace. Like you're everything I need you to be. There's no one else on this planet, you guys, that is everything you need them to be. Every single person in this room, the person sitting next to you, they will always, always, always fall, sh fall short. But there's one who won't. And his name is Jesus. And the reason why we love him is because he loved us first. Whew. Loving another with no benefit for ourselves is how God loves. He loved us without a benefit for himself. So when Jesus, when God sends his son, Jesus, to the world, it is him saying, I love you not for my benefit, but for your benefit. And so when we love God back, we're actually returning to him. It's the whole, it's your breath in our lungs, right? We're, we're giving him back what he first gave us. We're actually like returning, we're rebounding love. Like, do you guys watch the Olympics, the USA NBA team? Dude, it was amazing. If you haven't seen it, I'm not even a basketball fan. And I was like, this is the most epic bit round of basketball I've ever seen. Where you have Steph Curry, literally, like he could just throw a ball up in the air and it's going to go in no matter where he is on the court. It was, it was insane. 
And and there's this, it, it was it was nuts. But there's this thing with the Lord where it's like he he like throws his love to us, and we get to rebound it and bring it back. There's this like receiving and giving, this perpetual receiving and giving that happens when we step into a relationship with the Lord where he goes, I want you to have this. And then we receive it and we go, this actually has to, it's got to like come in and move out. It's, it's a receiving and giving. And it's just this amazing, it's kind of like dialysis. I don't even like, I don't like talking about that stuff, but it's the where it's like this, this love that comes in and goes out. It cleans everything in you, right? Okay, we're going we're gonna to move away from that because I don't like, I do not like blood, so we're going to move away from that example. But what I call love for somebody else's benefit, or, or in this case, loving God for his benefit, I, I want to kind of call it this as well. It's unconflicted, uninterrupted delight in communion with God unconflicted, uninterrupted communion with the Lord, where you come to the Lord and you're not worried about striving to get him to like you. You're not worried about like, oh, I just, I, well, God, I don't know. You don't know what I did last week. He's like, I know. And I knew when I saved you too. And so there's this like thought that we come into church and I got to make myself a, presentable to the Lord. I got to do these different things. He's like, I just want you. And guess what happens? When you realize he just wants you, you start to really want him. And there's this exchange where he goes, I want you. I want everything that you are, every part of who you are. And then it happens in us where we go, this is the natural response of love. It's to love and, and, and want every bit of that person to be who they are created to be, and in this case, it's God, but it's also each other. There's this thing at the beginning of the Bible, and it's at the end of the Bible as well. I'm not going to get into it today. But he created us in whose image? His image. And when Jesus, when the Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, what's the most important uh, commandment? He says, love your God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength. And then he says, then love your neighbor. And he says, this is the fulfillment of the law. This is where everything can fit on. It, it can hold the weight of life. Why can it hold the weight of life? Because when you love somebody else, you're actually loving God. Because if I love Jan or I love Al or I love Nate, I'm loving the image of God. You understand this? It's, it goes back to Matthew 25. Again, I'm not going to get into it, but I feel like we need context for it. Matthew 25, they're like, Jesus is like, you gave me drink. When I was thirsty, you clothed me when I was when I was naked. You visited me when I was in prison. I was hungry and you fed me. And they go, well, I, I didn't see you. Who, what? what? That, I didn't know that was you. He goes, it was my image. In loving them, you loved me. And so what we see as Christians is this, this entrance into a kingdom where when we love each other, we end up loving God. And when I love you, I love him. And when I love him, my natural response is to love you. That's why it's so weird when you find Christians who are not loving. That's why it should be so confusing when we are introduced with a Christian and they're like, oh yeah, I just, this Democrat over here, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? And they have zero love. Okay, I'm not, it's election year, I can do this zero love, and you go, I don't know if you've read this because it says in the Bible that if you know him, you are love. To know love is to be love. That when, when we get squeezed, what happens? It's, it's Todd White, Dan Mulder both say it. They say, if you squeeze an orange and apple juice came out, you'd be like, this is the weirdest orange I've ever seen. This is so weird. Because orange juice should be coming out of this. And then we have Christians, they get squeezed and stuff other than Jesus comes out. And we go, I don't get it. Yeah, I don't get it either. And I don't get it when it's me. Because I really love Jesus. And I have these moments where I'm driving on the road. This. <laughs> bing bong. <laughs> bing bong, bing bong, bing bong. <laughs> You got the, and you, you have these moments where you're like, this is dumb, dumb. What, are, what is going on? And, and you start to realize, oh no, 
there's a little cavern in my heart that has not been saturated with Jesus yet. There's a portion of my heart where I have started to divide and conquer and create my own loves and my own wills and how I want to live. And well, you know, it's, uh, there's a gray area there, Ethan. No, there's really not. He says, love your enemies. So if it's easy, if he says, here's where you start, starting line is love your enemies. You can, there, it's really, is there anybody else then? <laughs> it's, it's enemies and then everyone else, right? And so we have to get this, that God stepped into our situation and loved us when we were the most undeserving, when we could not earn his love. Mm. So how do we step into it? We start with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Luke 22, 41, 43, it says, And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw away and knelt down and prayed. This is where he's about to go be flogged and crucified. And he said, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. I want you to understand this. Jesus did not deny that his will wanted something other than the Father's will. That wasn't sin. His will, he came to the Father and said, Lord, I want something else out of this. Just like Polycarp, who's being uh, tied to a stake, about to be lit on fire, you have to think internally. He's like, I don't want this. Why else would he run to the countryside? Right? And Jesus, in the same thing, he does not deny himself, this deny this part of him that goes, I don't really want to do this. What is that? That's That's that survival instinct. But what does Jesus do? He was the perfect man who did not sin. There was no imperfection found in him. What does he do? He submits his flesh to the authority and will of the Father. He submits it under the plan of the Father, and he goes, this is actually not about me. That though I would like to not go through this, it's not about me. It's about you. Come on, what is Jesus doing in this moment? He is loving God for God's sake, not for his own. He's loving you for your sake, not for his own. It is love not for his own benefit, but for yours. Come on, this is the good news of the gospel. And in Hebrews 12 too, it says this, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So what happens when we submit ourself to the Lord's will, though it might be painful, though it might be the harder thing, what happens? It's joy unto us. You see where Jesus submits to the Father, angels come to strengthen him. And in this moment, it's also said that joy is before him as he's going to the cross. So what does that mean for us as Christians? That means when we submit ourselves to his will and not to our own, we get strength and we get joy. That was the joy we were experiencing in this room. There was people laughing. That's amazing. Do you know why? Because they're experiencing the joy that was set before Jesus. And then who becomes the joy for us? Jesus. That word joy in the Greek, it's, it's zappa. Or, or you could say it, chara, which means delight and gladness. Jesus set joy before him because there was delight ahead of him. The world says, "Do what you." Uh, the world says, "Do what makes you happy." Jesus says, "Put others before yourself." That's where happiness is. The world says, "You do you. Focus on you. You only live once. Live your truth." Jesus says, "Actually." The most true you is when you put on Christ. The most true you is when you leave yourself and you go, actually, I want to care about the needs of others before myself. That's the most true you. Do you know why that's amazing? Because it takes all the weight off of trying to get yours. (laughs) Well, I got to get mine. I got to plan mine. This has got to work out for me in the end. It really, it doesn't. In loving God, for, uh, in the love of self for self's sake model, we are humans trying to become gods to express love for our own benefit. 
in loving God for God's self model, God is God and becomes human to express love for the benefit of others. Can I rewind that for a second? When we are obsessed with ourselves, what do we try to do? We try to put ourselves in the middle of our universe and we want everybody else to bow down to my needs and my wants and what should be good for me. And you get out of the way. I'm in a hurry. I don't have time for this. This is me, 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 me. What does God do? God takes himself. He puts himself in the center of our universe and he humbles himself and does not make himself this big, proud person. He came to serve, not to be served. So our model before Christ is typically, I am God. Look at me. Do what I need. Everybody else, get in line with it. You need to fall under my identity, how I want to live, what I want to do, what I get out of this. In God's world, he steps into our world and says, how can I help you? God does that. God, the one who spoke the world into existence, humbles himself, puts on flesh, comes into our world and says, you're not deserving of it, but I'm still here. Dude, you didn't earn it, but I'm still here. I'll inconvenience myself for you. Come on, guys. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. So we're finally there. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. Okay. Uh, if if it's in, in my if your Bible's like mine, the whole paragraph is just pink. It's all highlighted. It's just there's nothing to look at anymore. It's just one color. Um, it says this. It says so. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, which is hala. It's the same word, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Listen, do nothing from self-ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. Where is the example, Paul? Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Paul's about to say, here's our example who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. It was not something he felt wor- that you... God was with men. God slept on a wet boat, smelly fish, crying loud men who were scared of <laughs> waves. He's like in the, mo- he, he even at one point is like, gosh, these guys will not stop fighting about who's the best. Can I just be done? Like, he's like, he, he puts himself in the middle of it all. And then he says, I'm not going to even try to grasp what it was like to be God. Like he could have said, okay, gold streets everywhere. Get my throne right here. I want 24 elders right here. Casting crowns constantly. Okay. I need cherubim, I need cherubim, more cherubim, more, 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 right? <laughs> like he, he really, you understand that's what he could have done. He could have showed up and been like, okay, I need this going on. I need somebody bringing perfume, pouring it on my feet. I need, you know, like he could have literally came and they would have done it because he's God. But he comes as a servant, puts a towel around his waist and he says, how can I wash your feet? And Peter, Peter no, 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 you can't wash my feet. No, I actually have to. God. And so he does not count himself equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In following Jesus, we follow his example. If you say, I am a follower of Jesus, what what did Jesus do? Who humbled Jesus? He humbled himself. He didn't wait for somebody to say, no, buddy, 
you got to sit at the end of the table, right? He humbles himself. And so to love well, we actually have to empty ourselves of ourselves and fill ourselves with the wants, the desires, and the likeness of the person we're trying to become like. Does that make sense? That there actually is what Paul calls putting off of Paul and putting on Christ. There is a transition, a transfiguration, a transformation from old into new where we say, actually, I can't keep living the way I want to live because if I live the way I want to live, it will implode in on itself. Like my heart and my soul will be so obsessed with self and my Amazon wish list and my social media feeds and everything like that, that if I get so caught up in this, it'll destroy me. But Jesus says, die. And then you live. When you die, you live. Okay? In 1 Corinthians, Paul says this in 13, 4 through 8. He describes what love is. This is what love is. Love is patient and it is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It, do, it does not insist on its own way. Come on, spouses. Oh, you guys got real quiet there. It does not insist on its own way. People, if you have an opinion and you just think your opinion is always number one in the room, that's insisting on your own way. But humility comes and says, you know what? This is my opinion, Nate, but like maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this isn't what's best. It comes to the place to go, actually, humility says, I might not be it. Right? It's not insisting on its own way. Well, I'll stay that I'm gonna, you know, I'll stay working there as long as I get my way. If I if I can, you know, if they if the managers will listen to me, I'll stay there long enough. But we don't look at our managers like, oh, actually, am I serving the Lord? Like this frustrating individual that I'm working for. You guys are like, you think you don't know? No, I know. I have, I had work in a secular environment. I know what it's like to work with managers I fully disagree with on how we run our business and things like that. Like, I'm not just talking ethics or morals. I'm talking like full on, like day to day. I'm like, guys, goodness gracious, if we just do this, it'll be fixed. Right? But what, what, do, what, what happens if I insist and insist and insist I'm right, they're wrong? What are they feeling? They're not feeling love. They're feeling pride. All they're feeling is arrogance, pride. I'm the best. Everything I have to say is the best. Right? That's pride. But love does not insist on its own way, even if it's true. You could say, this is truth. This is truth. It's just, I'll give you the truth if you want it. I'll give you it if you need it. But like, I'm not going to pound it down your throat. I'm not going to beat you over the head with it. Yeah? Every wife in the room said, amen, pasta. <laughs> Tell my husband about the curtains. <laughs> Sorry, we're, <laughs> we're picking paint colors and curtains and stuff like that for our house right now. It's like, we... It's her soaker tub, and I'm just like, no, I don't like that faucet. We need a better faucet. It's not even my tub. I hate baths. I shower. Okay, here, here we go. A little comedic relief, and we're back on it. It does not insist on its own. It is not irritable or resentful. That means it does not hold a grudge. It, is, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with truth. Now listen to this. Love bears all things. It can carry the weight of all things. Love believes all things. What does that mean? It, it has trust for every situation. That's what that word believe. It means trust. It has enough trust for every situation you walk into. Okay? What does that mean? That means that if I have love, I can walk into a situation and go, God, I know you are with me. I trust you. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. That's trust. Love has that, okay? So if you have love, you can bear a lot of weight. You can have trust through really hard situations. And you have hope through every situation. Hope's all things. And you have the endurance for all things. Love doesn't ever end. 
that means it does not run dry. That means that if you have God, your bank account is full of love. That like you're, well, I'm done with them. I can't do that anymore. I've given them too much. I've forgiven them too many times. Don't make me go back to my forgiveness message, right? This is that whole thing. It's like, well, I've already, I've, I'm done dealing with that person. That's okay. You can have boundaries, but you still have to love. It doesn't mean they have to be at your table, but it does mean that if you run into them at Walmart, you love. It does mean that if you walk across them at a same restaurant, you see them, you love. It means that if they say something snarky at you while you're walking by, you don't respond and you love. Oh, well, I have a right. Jesus said, once you get slapped with one, on one cheek, give them the other, but after that, it's on. <laughs> Nope, not in the Bible. <laughs> not in the Bible. Man. So if we want to experience this kind of love I'm talking about, this kind of undeserving, selfless love, which gives of, it gives of itself from a, from a well that does not run dry, we need to have intimacy with the delight and joy that we are searching out in God. So we need God. We need intimacy, connection, and relationship with him, to actually find delight and joy in him. To not come to church and just be like, oh, here we go again. They're singing, you are good for 20 minutes, right? <laughs> you know, I always do that. Do you know what I mean, though? Like, it, it, it's coming in, and you come to church, and you're like, actually, what I'm here for is to give of the love I've been receiving all week to everyone around me. And we wonder, why do people get hurt in church? Because they're coming to a church and they have not spent any time with the Lord, so they're coming to consume and not to contribute. Yeah. I don't understand it, Ethan. It's because we have been taught and molded that the pastor will do it for us. No, just like Rodney said last week, I can't give you a revelation. You have to connect to the revelation. Yeah. He is the bread of life. You connect to him, you get a revelation. And then when we're singing and you start saying, you are good, every you are good has a picture of everything he's ever done for you. Oh, you are good. Look at my beautiful children. You are good. Look at my beautiful, my house. Look at, you are good. I have a job that pays my, my needs. You are good. I've never gone hungry. You are good. I have clothes to wear. You are good that even though inflation's crazy right now, I'm still here. We're like, we're not, you're not just singing words. You actually are starting to paint the picture. You're starting to actually go, there's actually meaning behind these lyrics. Do you guys understand that? We're not just singing what's on a screen. You're putting it into your life and going, look at these beautiful gifts the Lord's given me. You are good. And you start to realize Jesus actually sees you as a gift and that you were the joy set before him. And that as we're singing, you are good, he's going, I love you. This is amazing. It's not just, we're not singing to the air. Like he's in us and with us and he's all around us. A.W. Yeah. Tozer, he says this, this is so good. He says, it is one thing to hear about a concept, but another to live that concept. It is one thing to hear that there has been a planet suddenly discovered, but quite another thing to live on that planet. I cannot claim that I can know as much about a place by reading about it as most people who will go there. But everybody who goes to a place and comes back is all smiles for having actually been there. If you have actually been there, you know it in a way you cannot know it if you just read about it in a book. Some of you have been reading, and Jesus is like, would you come? Would you, in a, in, in, when you come to, to service or on a Monday morning or a Wednesday, you're starting your day, your kids are being crazy, or maybe you don't have kids, you're thinking, I don't know how we're going to pay the bills. Would you come? Would you come and experience the intimacy and the love that I have for you that you cannot earn and that you do not deserve, but yet I will give it to you in more abundance than you can handle? Would you come? And some, you guys, sometimes it's like what Lydia said today. There's sometimes these invitations of the Holy Spirit where he's saying, lift your hands, dance, shout, come forward, 
and I'm not just talking about a worship set. I'm talking about like activating where the Lord's like, come out of what you're in. Come out. And you actually have to physically do something to get out of it, to, to tell your spirit, no, like I'm actually not, I'm not going to partner with this. I'm not going to partner with the stress or the depression or the anxiety I experienced last week that has nothing to do with his work. And if it did, then Polycarp would say, yeah, I'm out. Don't give me those lions. Don't give me that fire. If it actually had to do with your circumstance, then all these people who gave their life, it would be absolutely for nothing. But all these martyrs and all these people and Jesus himself coming into the hardest situation of their entire lives, what do they do? They love God for his sake. They forget about the circumstance and they say, you are my circumstance. You have adopted me. You have brought me into the family of God. You have washed me white as snow. I am clean. I am new. Dude. And guess what? Can we get mature here for a minute? It's not the pastor's job to talk you into it. It's our job to do it, even as Nate read that psalm, to read the word and speak it into our lives, into existence, to go, actually, I find myself in here. My name's in here. Like, as I read this, and it goes, oh, he gave himself for every single person. I'm not reading about, uh, I'm not reading about my dad or, or, uh, or, or Georgina or whatever. I'm not reading it for you. I'm reading it for me. I'm reading about how Paul put off Paul and put on Christ, and all I'm thinking is, Ethan put off Ethan, and now I'm hidden in Christ. Now I'm hidden in him. So that means that like, when I look in the mirror, I don't remind myself of all my past failures and everything I did wrong. When I look in the mirror, I go, Jesus lives in here. So if Jesus lives in here, as I go, Jesus should be going. That means when you encounter me, you should be encountering Jesus. That's not like, oh, that's a lot of work. It's not a lot of work when you love him. When you start to learn to actually love him the way that he deserves to be loved. And yes, I don't get it always right. Yes, I experience frustration. Yes, I, I don't maybe do everything the right way all the time. Or maybe I'm, it's like I let my feelings get involved. I'm not talking to you as somebody who's like, yeah, I figured this out. What I ha can tell you and guarantee to you is the more I let go of what Ethan wants and I put on what Christ wants, I become that image. I become that image that Jesus is trying to form us all into. And that's why we're doing that Wednesday night class. It is always unto us becoming Christ, becoming and being formed and shaped into the likeness of Jesus. Because I'm telling you, if you're not being formed into the likeness of Jesus, you're being formed into something else. If you are being formed, you are, the question is not, are you being formed or are you being discipled? You are. It's just who is doing it. What's doing it to you? Okay? 1 John 4, 7 through 11. We're land in the plane here. Okay? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So there's two guarantee. If you love, you have been born of God and you know God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, period. If you do not love, you do not know God, especially during election year. Okay? It does not mean you cannot speak truth. You speak truth in love, right? Right? It says, because God is love. Anyone who does not, I'm sorry, in this, in this, the love of God made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world. He initiated that love so that we might love through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So look at this. If God is love, that means that love cannot be understood as one of God's many individual expressions. Rather, all of God's expressions are wrapped up in one expression, love. 
So it's not just, ooh, look at all these characteristics about God. He, look at all these different things about him. No, everything he does, every part of who he, who he is, it's all completely enveloped in love. There is no such thing as God doing anything, even justice. Even his wrath is a form of love. Come on. If you broke into my house, you're like, I don't understand that, Ethan. Wrath, how is wrath love? If you broke, up, broke into my house and tried to attack my kids, you would experience my love for my kids. Do you, under, you see what I'm saying? It's my love for my kids that's causing me to beat the Paul button. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, that's actually completely not biblical. Jesus is like, don't do that. But I can't say that I have that self-control if that's in that situation. But... <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like my, in me protecting and defending my kids, they're experiencing my love. It's an expression of love, of protection and defense. Okay? Everything he does is love. So if everything he does is love and he gives his love to undeserving people, don't you think that you and I should be giving our love to undeserving people? And isn't that what it means to love God not for our benefit is to love people who are out there who have all kinds of crazy thinking and all kinds of crazy identities and all kinds of stuff like that. But guess what? You and I are crazy to them because we're saying, actually, my life is not about me. It's about God. My life is actually not about following my will. It's about following him. That's crazy to the world right now. Yeah? Yeah? And so when we go into the world and we go, I didn't have to earn God's love, and guess what? You don't have to earn mine. I didn't have to earn it from him. You don't have to earn it from me. I didn't deserve it when he gave it to me. And guess what? You don't deserve it either. But guess what's coming your way? A whole lot of love. Why? Because I'm not concerned about my benefit. I'm concerned about yours. In giving undeserved love away to those around us, we end up loving God rightly because we are expressing the one activity, the hot lava core of who God is, love. In loving people who don't deserve our love, we love God and remind ourselves of how he loved us even when we didn't deserve it. It's rebounding love back and forth, okay? So how do we clear the way for this, right? That's kind of a, I think that's kind of how our messages end now, probably forever. What do we need to do with this? I think that uh, for the majority of my life in Christianity, it's always, it was always pretty consistently about addition, do more. And I think like really most of this is actually just subtraction. It's, it's like actually more so about what do, we, what do we get rid of that's actually causing us to not love well? And that could be the media, that could be social media, that could be the news. That could be, if you're listening to resources or news broadcasts and things like that, that just try to point your finger at a group of people that are evil, and your whole mindset now towards a group of people that are children of God, that God actually really loves, and your whole, group, your whole mindset is they're evil, I want nothing to do with them. Uh-oh, guess what that's called? That's called you making them into Samaritans. That's called you saying, these are Samaritans. What does that mean? For in the Jewish culture, they couldn't stand Samaritans. They were that group that you don't like. And guess what Jesus does? He says, let me tell you a story where the Christian got it, was really Jews, but imagine it this way, where the Christian got it wrong and the Republican got it wrong, but the Democrat got it right. I am not saying vote. You guys have heard enough sermons of me. You know where, I'm, where I am at, okay? But you know what I'm saying here, where if you listen to something and it's just hatred, 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 these people, blah, 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 blah. Because I already know I'm talking to a major, mainly Republicans in this room, okay? So I'm just kind of grouping you all together. Do you know what I'm saying? That's why he's like, but the Samaritan stopped. And he paid his own money to get this man into an inn. And he healed his wounds. And he helped protect. Yeah. And you have to think the Jews were like, oh, 
gosh, what a lousy story. <laughs> Where you, all the good guys in your mind you walked right by, but the bad guy in your mind said, no, I'll help. Okay, I'm not, you know, yeah, I don't even need to clarify. What do we do with this? We ask ourselves, what is going on in my loves? When I encounter people, am I telling this person, you need to earn my love? You need to earn it. Until you deserve it, you're not getting any of it. We have to ask ourselves that. I'm not saying trust. Trust and love are not the same, okay? We, didn't, I'm not, we don't need to get fully into that. Trust and love are different, okay? Jesus had 12 men he trusted, okay? But he was not inviting Pharisees to his table when he had business to talk about with his 12, okay? There's a difference there. But love is always given freely away, okay? Because it has to do with respect. It has, it has to do, I always come back to Katie's quote, humility is looking at others in assessing, I can't even remember how it was, but it's, it's assessing somebody's value. I think that's what it was. It's you're rightly assessing their value and you're going, you're actually worth my love. Not because you did anything, but because of, you bear the image of Jesus. Okay? So how do we make room for this? We delight in God. In Psalms 4, 40, 7 through 8, it says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is written on my heart. When we delight ourselves in God, all of a sudden, our wills get changed. Come on. You ever been in worship and you're in worship and all of a sudden the Lord's convicting you, not in a bad way, and you go, yeah, I don't think I want to keep smoking. I don't think I want to keep uh, doing this. I, don't, I think I need to stop shopping. I think uh, materialism is cre creeping its way in. I think I'm being greedy with my money. I think I'm like, right? And, and it's actually not the Lord being like, you're not doing it right. He's actually going, free yourself of you. Let it go. Delight yourself in me and everything else will come. Okay? And then this all wraps back to the very beginning. The first message that I talked to you guys about, I talked to you about the Shema. What is the Shema? It's the Jewish prayer. It is, it is literally the number one commandment that Jesus says. It's to love your God with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. It says in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. You can go back and listen to that. It's kind of like the intro to this series if you want to know what that means. But what they would do, what the Jews would do, is they would wake up at 8 a.m. in the morning. They'd wake up and they'd say, I will love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my strength, with all my soul. And then they would go to sleep last thing before they go to sleep. I will love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my, with all, oh my gosh, I can't even talk right now. I will, and it's really, it's the totality of who you are. I will love the Lord my God with everything in me at beginning when the sun is rising and when the sun is setting. So it's not about, oh, well, I gotta, you gotta, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta stop doing, it's just slow down and realize your loves are doing something to you and your love's placed in the right place, praying the Shema, it will organize your love, and it will cause you to love the Lord your God for his benefit and not for yours. Okay? It will cause you to come into church and go, this is about him. It's not about me. This is about my children knowing him. This is about this person across from me experiencing the love of Jesus through me. This is not about what do I get out of the clearing. It's about what can I contribute to the clearing. Oh, well, I'm an introvert. I don't really like to talk to people. Where you start to see people and the Lord starts working on your heart and you see somebody who looks really discouraged and you go, hey, can I give you some encouragement? I'm full. I'm full and I'm ready to give it away. And that only comes through delighting yourself in the Lord and going, my wills and my loves are pointed in a direction and it is squarely at Jesus. Right at him. Amen? Okay, that's loving God for God's sake, okay? 